Often when you're building a project you'll need to flatten down the top surface of a relatively small piece. Ideally you'd perhaps use a planer or a drum sander or maybe even a belt sander but sometimes that's not possible or practical. Perhaps you don't have a planer because like me you don't have the space or because you don't need one very often and the only sander you have is a random orbit one which is great for smoothing but not so good for removing material. Welcome to Lawrence Plays with Power Tools, where I'm going to be putting together a router planing sled. I built this as a bit of a distraction during a larger project that I'm still working on. The planer sled system consists of two parts. There's a bottom plate which supports the workpiece and has a rail on either side. These need to be quite accurate. The bottom plate has to be dead flat and the rails have to be exactly the same height with completely flat tops. Any inaccuracies here will lead to your workpieces being flattened at an angle rather than with the top and bottom faces completely parallel. The other part is a wide sled with the router attached that can be slid around on top of the rails allowing you to cut on any part of the workpiece. Once again it needs to be nice and flat to ensure accurate cuts. I had a rummage around in the wood pile in the loft and managed to find this sheet that would make for a nice bottom plate. I think it was probably a shelf in a previous life. It's veneered chipboard which means it should hold its shape nicely and from checking it with a straight edge it is nice and flat. I've also got this plank from a previous project. It's a bit too wide really but that gives me a bit of extra flexibility with the planer sled. I thought it would be much easier to add spaces in underneath the workpiece to tr than to try and lift the router up when working on something bigger. I measured it carefully and the sides were nice and flat and the width consistent. It seemed perfect so I cut it in half to make the two rails. I marked out where I wanted the rails to go, getting them perpendicular to the board. This angle doesn't have to be perfect, but I wanted to get it about right. Because I was planning to screw the rails in place, I then marked out where both edges of the rails would be, ensuring I could line it up accurately and put the screws into the middle of the rails. This pine would split and splinter very easily if I wasn't careful, so I wanted to make sure there was no risk of the screws coming out of the sides of the wood. I then clamped the first rail in place and drilled pilot holes through the board and rail, again to reduce the risk of splitting. While the rails were still clamped, it was easy to run a couple of screws in to hold it in place. The drill is easily powerful enough to countersink the screws into the wood without having to drill countersunk holes. I then repeated the process with the other rail and used a spirit level to make sure that the rails were horizontal. With the rails attached, the bottom part of the planer was finished and I could start work on the sled. For this, I had a nice flat piece of 9mm MDF and I thought this would probably be thick enough to not flex under the weight of the router, but I was going to make sure of that later. I found the centre of it, drilled a hole and then used the jigsaw to enlarge the hole, making sure it was easily big enough for the router bit to pass through. The biggest challenge I ran into here was how to securely attach the router to the MDF. I believe that some routers have base panels which can be removed to allow them to be attached to something like this. However, I don't think mine has that feature. For now, I've passed a couple of screws through holes in the base and into the MDF using washers to ensure they stay secure. However, in the long run, I intend to replace the screws with bolts held in place with nuts. If I don't do this, eventually the screws will stop gripping the inside of the holes properly and will slip out. The screws don't need to take a great deal of force, and what force they do take is all lateral as you move the sled around, but I would still prefer it to be a bit more secure. In order to ensure that the MDF wouldn't flex under the weight of the router, I added a couple of batons along the top of it, held in place by screws at the end and in the middle, and then reinforced it with wood glue. I'm not sure this is necessary, but I wanted to be sure. I don't want to end up with low spots in the middle of anything I plane. Now both parts are complete, assembly is as simple as clamping the bottom panel to your workbench and placing the sled on top of it. With it assembled like this, you can slide the sled around on top of the rails and know that it's always the same distance above the bottom. After making my first couple of cuts, I decided it would be much easier to keep track of how I was progressing if I put some ruler marks along the rails. I added marks every centimetre and then labelled them. I strongly recommend doing this, it makes it much easier to perform each cut in the right place. It doesn't actually have to be precise, but it means you can tell how far you've got since the sled hides the workpiece from view. At this point, I realised that the rails I'd fitted were much taller than they needed to be for what I was working on, and the router bit wouldn't be able to reach all the way down. I tried using some pieces of flat scrap wood to lift the work up, and whilst that did work, I wasn't very happy with it. It felt inaccurate. I considered using a longer router bit, 
However, longer bits tend to be very narrow, so it would mean I would need to make a lot more passes and it wouldn't cut quite as neatly. For jobs like this, the wider the bit is, the better, as it will give smoother cuts and allow you to play in a larger area with each pass. However, do note that the larger your bit, the more slowly you'll want to move it. I decided that the best fix for this problem would be to replace the rails with some much thinner ones, but hang on to the ones I'd already made in case I need to plane something thicker in the future. These pieces were perfect, once again being flat and an even thickness the whole way along, so I swapped the rails over and again marked distances on them with a marker. The tape was intended to allow the router sled to slide around more smoothly, but I don't think it made much difference. Time to use it. I swapped the bit for my largest one. It's about 15mm in diameter, which means it will take quite wide cuts out of the wood, reducing the number of passes required. The next challenge was how to secure the workpiece down. My first thought was to use double-sided sticky tape, however, due to the unevenness of the workpiece before I planed it, this didn't hold at all. My next idea was to stick a couple of blobs of hot glue on the corners to hold it down. This worked well, however, it was difficult to remove the wood after flattening it. The glue was a bit too strong. If you have a better suggestion, please let me know in the comments. When you're placing the workpiece, make sure it's held securely and is absolutely flat. You'll be making this side parallel to the base of the planer jig, and so you'll want to make sure you aren't flattening it at an angle. Once the workpiece is secured, lower the router so at the tip of the bit will cut the workpiece. You don't want to take off too much at a time. A few millimetres at once is the most I'd recommend. You also want to make sure you don't cut down too far. Typically you'll want to cut down until you've just skimmed the surface of the lowest part of the work. If it takes multiple passes to get down to that level, that's fine. It's better to go slowly and get a good result. Before turning the router on, I recommend sliding it around to get a feel of how it moves and to help you find the edges of the workpiece. For example, I found that the top of mine was about 25 on the ruler and the bottom was at about 4, so I knew I needed to cover that entire range. When you're ready to start cutting, turn the router on and, assuming it spins clockwise, move it over so that the cutting head is to the right of the workpiece and it's pushed back to your starting point in my case 25 centimetres. Slowly move it over to the left until the cutting head has passed to the left of the work. Your first cut probably won't actually take off any material, so now we move the router slightly further away, bring it back over to the right. This makes sure it doesn't catch on the workpiece on the return stroke. Once the cutting head is to the right of the work again, move it a little bit closer to you. You ideally want to move less than the radius, that is half the diameter of the cutting bit, perhaps 5 millimetres at a time, so bring it in that bit closer and then slowly run it to the left again. This time you'll probably start to cut through the wood, bringing the thickness down. Once you've run all the way across, push it away again, then over to the right, and repeat the process again, moving slightly closer than on the last pass. Keep repeating this process, slowly moving down the workpiece. You can pause between lines if you want to break, or if you want to see how the process is going. Just slide the router away from you so you can see the workpiece, or simply pick it up. Here's an example of my first cuts before I had the ruler marks in place, and you can see why I needed them. It does show very nicely how the process works though. Once you've finished a complete set of passes all the way down the piece of work, you can lower the height of the router bit by another couple of millimetres and repeat the whole process to bring the surface down slightly further. Take as many passes as you need to completely flatten the top, then you'll probably want to flip it over and repeat the process on the other side to get both sides flattened and the thickness to where you want it. You'll find that this process leaves a lot of marks on the surface from the router bit, although the higher the quality of your tools and your jig, the less obvious they'll be. You'll still need to sand it heavily once you're finished, but I haven't done that with these pieces, as they need some more gluing and probably another run through to flatten them once they're fully assembled. One suggestion I have heard is putting masking tape around the edges of the uh, workpiece in order to prevent chip out on the edges. I didn't think of this until after I'd finished, so I haven't tried it here, but if you have tried it, let me know how it went in the comments. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you can see the rest of the build and what I'm trying to make. I hope this video has been interesting, and maybe even useful. I think you can see my skills improving with each video. Maybe one day I'll actually be good at this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.